Okay, CB sir, let's start the meeting now. Okay. Okay, sir. A warm good afternoon to all. Let's start today's webinar with a silent prayer. Thank you all. Today's webinar is the third in this series of webinars organized by St. Joseph's College of Pharmacy. Our previous webinar had speakers from around the world to enlighten PharmD students and graduates on the various opportunities awaiting them. Today's webinar will further throw light on this path. I take this opportunity to appreciate the support provided by our director, Dr. Sister Betty Carla, and principal, Dr. DCPA in organizing this webinar series. First, I would like to invite our director, Dr. Sister Betty Carla, for the message. Over to you, Sister. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Yes, continue, sister. You are audible. Hello. Hello, CB sir. CB sir. No, no, no. My sister uh, is not audible, I think. Uh. <laughs> Okay, we'll wait for just two, two minutes more. Mm. Okay, Carla sister is ready, I think. What do you do, Carla? Hello? Hello. Hello, Carla sister. Audible on eh? Ah. Okay. May I invite you, Dr. Sister Betty Carla, for the message? Hello? Hello? Parna sister, audible Anna. Hello? Hello, sister, yes. audible Anna. Okay, okay, okay. Dr. Sister Teslin, Dr. Mohammed Hishan, Dr. Vrinda Nambudri, and friends. I'm glad to introduce the St. Joseph College of Pharmacy webinar series 3 on family program, a global perspective. Today's speakers, Dr. Mohammed Hishan and Dr. Vrinda Nambudri are young clinical pharmacists, experts in the field. Wish you good luck in your career. 
Dr. Hishan will enlighten us with his clinical experience in the Middle East. And Dr. Runda is an expert working in Amrita Hospital, Cochin, and she will explain the Indian scenario. Dear budding pharmacists attending the webinar, you can explore the opportunities for PharmD worldwide. Clinical pharmacy is an evergreen field with many opportunities and you can flourish with your efforts and study on clinical cases. The diseases and the medication are so vivid and increasing day by day with the dedication and knowledge. With your permission and blessings, I inaugurate the today's webinar. Wish you good luck, have a nice time, and praying for heavenly blessings. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Next, I would like to invite our principal, Dr. Sister Daisy P.A. for a few words. Uh, good afternoon, friends. We are happy that today St. Joseph's College of Pharmacy is conducting the webinar series, out of which it is the third one. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Hishan and Dr. Vinda Nambudri are with us to speak to our family students and graduates about their experiences from Middle East as well as in India. Hope it will be very beneficial for the budding pharmacists uh, who are aspiring to be clinical pharmacists especially. So I wish all success for the pro program and dear graduates and students of AMD, please take benefit of this talk by attending honestly. Wish you all the best. May God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, sister. We would like to acknowledge the initiative taken by Dr. Sibi Joseph, HOD, Department of Pharmacy Practice, and the encouragement provided by all my dear colleagues to conduct this webinar. Our first session for the day will be handled by Dr. Mohammed Hisham, Clinical Pharmacist, Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi, UAE. Mohammed Hisham is currently working as a clinical staff pharmacist at Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi. Since 2016, he earned his Bachelor of Pharmacy from Amrita School of Pharmacy, Cochin, Kerala, and his Doctor of Pharmacy from KMCH College of Pharmacy, Coimbatore. Before joining Cleveland Clinic, he worked as an ICU clinical pharmacist for four years in India. Hishan is an American board certified clinical care pharmacist. He has 20 publications, including a book on general management of poisoning. He has presented more than 25 research papers and over 30 invited talks. Mr. Hisham serves as a journal reviewer for British Medical Journal case reports and human and experimental toxicology. He has also received the prestigious honorary award from the Indian Society of Toxicology for his valuable contribution in the field of toxicology straight from Dr. V. V. Pillai. He was awarded the best preceptor for pharmacy internship program at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi in March 2018. Hisham also received several awards for his research, including Young Intensive Award for his best innovative research paper in 2016. His interests include infectious disease, critical care, clinical research, and clinical toxicology. With these few words, I would like to invite Dr. Mohammad Hisham for his talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me start off with uh, sharing my slides. Okay. Uh, is my slides visible? Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. We can see. Perfect. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, setting up uh, this wonderful platform for the budding pharmacists and students who uh, aspire to become the future of the clinical pharmacy profession in the country. So uh, just 
uh, not waste time. We will be starting with the topic of discussion today. Uh, I would be sharing my experience as a clinical pharmacist and uh, the PharmD program as a whole in this country. And a uh, couple of other things which comes along with this talk is what the is the core of the presentation. So if you have any questions, I can definitely take it at the end of the presentation or this is my email address uh, from which you can even uh, mail me uh, asking questions or in case you need these slides, you can ask me for the slides as well. All Everything is available. So if you ask me for slides, there are only uh, 14 slides in this. Uh, we'll be going through all. It will be most of the time I would be through the talking rather than um, the information on the slides will be hyperlinks to the website links which I would be discussing on. I do not have any disclosures. So the learning objective for today are these four points. These four points are what was asked to be discussed today uh, by the organizers. So I would be discussing the pharmacy licensing requirement for becoming a clinical pharmacist or a pharmacist in the Middle East. And uh, I would discuss the clinical pharmacy opportunities in the Middle East. Uh, we would identify challenges for foreign pharmacy graduates. We would be analyzing the strategies to explore the clinical pharmacy opportunities to overcome the challenges or doing better in the field of clinical pharmacy if you are, have any plans for coming to the Middle East. So as uh, before I start, like everyone who take up this profession, either try to serve their country in their country or they try to uh, come abroad. Uh, it could be anywhere. And most of them try to come to the Middle East or the Gulf region. So everyone has a question. How can we come and explore the opportunities here? How do we get through after the course? What are the basic requirements? So all these are the things which I would be covering in, uh, in this presentation. And apart from that, I would be discussing what opportunities we have uh, along with all these things in the profession here in this region and uh, what are the current challenges in case uh, if you are coming up here is there any challenges which we can overcome before coming here and if we can do it better okay so first thing is requirements so as uh, if you're taking up pharmacy profession and you're planning to come uh, outside the country to work in the middle east this is the basic requirement for the pharmacy uh, profession so if you're looking for a clinical pharmacy job it needs a basic qualification of a pharmd a minimum six years course or a b farm plus a PharmD post baccalaureate or a MPharm clinical pharmacy uh, qualification. This is the basic requirement for a clinical pharmacist licensing process. If you're planning to work uh, outside the country, it's mainly focusing in the Middle East. Again, if it's for the pharmacist, all these apply. It could be a bachelor of pharmacy, a PharmD, or a person with the PharmD post baccalaureate or an MPharm along with all the qualifications. The, this is the basic degree qualifications, the affiliations needed uh, for the pharmacy profession. Once they graduate, after that, they will need two years of experience. So if they're choosing a profession uh, to be a clinical pharmacist in any of these Middle East countries, they need two years of clinical pharmacy experience post qualification that is after they complete their degree they have to get two years minimum of clinical pharmacy experience this is excluding the internship so internship is considered as a part of the curriculum which makes it six years or a pharmd post baccalaureate completion so internship is not considered as a working experience so after the internship which makes it a uh, completion of the course or post qualification, they need two years of clinical pharmacy experience, which is a minimum qualification. And then they can apply for the licensing process. If, if someone's applying for a pharmacist position, uh, they need two years of working experience, post qualification, the uh, same, excluding the uh, internship experience, which even could be in a community pharmacy or a hospital pharmacy, does not need to be clinical pharmacy specifically. Again, something which needs to be noted is uh, industrial experience or pharmaceutical experience or all the other experience which does not fit into this would not be qualifying for a pharmacist position or a clinical pharmacist position. If, if someone has a clinical pharmacy experience, they can apply for clinical pharmacy. If someone has a pharmacist experience in, uh, say, a hospital, the hospital pharmacy, or in a community pharmacy, then they can apply for the pharmacist. Anything related to industry or pharmaceutical uh, co companies and all, these may not be useful. These, this experience may not be useful for applying 
for any of these two jobs in the in, in the Middle East countries. So what are the required documents? So uh, what, how the process works is after you have these uh, two uh, qualifications plus two years of minimum experience, you are eligible to start processing for the licensing exam. First thing is you have to start processing for the licensing exam. You have to qualify a criteria which fulfills the requirements for the exam. Once you are approved, then they, you are eligible to take the exam after you take the exam, you get a note, you get a uh, eligibility letter that you have qualified for the exam and you are, uh, you can take up any jobs in the country. And then it goes on from a job hunt from which you'll have to find a job in any of these countries. So how does the, these process work is what I would be discussing in my presentation. And uh, I would be taking you through a stepwise process in which it will have most of the details. Apart from these details, you'll be able to get the others in the website and in the uh, sections where it is needful. I would put the hyperlink as well in the slides. So if you can see what are the basic documents required for the data flow verification. So all these documents, what they do is to make sure that you are eligible for the exam, the licensing pharmacist licensing exam, they make sure you, they undergo a third party verification to make sure that all these certificates are valid. It is not fake or forged. So all these certificates are valid and it has to be properly attested and have to go through a whole process. It may take two months, minimum two to six months. It depends upon how you apply if all your documents are right and everything has been done appropriately. So what are the documents required for applying for the pharmacist licensing exam in any of these countries? You need attested certificates for the 10th, 12th and your degree certificates that is bachelor's or PharmD or if it's a bachelor pharmacy, then a PharmD post back, back, then it has to be both. Or if it's an M farm, you have to have the M farm as well as the uh, B farm uh, certificate as well. The transcript certificates for all, all of these qualifications, plus uh, the mark list as well. For some, they ask mark list, some they don't ask mark list. They will need the pharmacy council registration certificate, uh, the valid two year working experience certificate that is from the place you're working. It could be a still working certificate. You've not resigned your job, you're still working. It could be a still working certificate or it could be a, a certificate which has a completed course like two years completed and you've left the job, you're working somewhere else. It could be that way as well. So it could be a still working or a completed two years uh, working experience certificate. Apart from that, you'll need a good standing certificate from the State Pharmacy Council. So important thing is these are the basic requirements. Uh, this keeps updating on the website. So something which you have to do is you have to keep, make sure, uh, you'll have to always look in the website and make sure the country you're applying or the place you're applying has uh, the updated list and you have, you have all those documents ready. Apart from that, the passport. So passport, the name in the passport has to match all the names, uh, spellings in these certificates. That is very important. Or else they will reject and it will be a whole hectic process to do uh, it all over again. And uh, what does attestation means? There is multiple steps of attestation. One is you'll have to do uh, attestation through the secretariat or the NOCA or uh, some of the certificates may need a ministry uh, attestation of external affairs or ministry attestation so that uh, to make sure that this is a valid certificate and you can work outside the country if you qualify for the exam. So data flow process as a whole is a verification process done for the licensing center uh, or the uh, authority in the country. This is a third party uh, verification. So these are the basic re documents required and it has to uh, make sure all your names, the spelling of your name in all of these certificates matches and it has to match the passport, uh, the name, the passport. Along with that, the attestation is done appropriately. So all this helps you to keep all these documents ready and it has to be done uh, scanned back and front. That is the front and the back of the documents have to be scanned. And this is what is required when you apply for the data verification process. So usually what, uh, what everyone does is uh, they go through agents or uh, companies in the country who do this, like uh, what you call like a, comp uh, a company which helps you with the data pr flow process. So some of the uh, more 
most common uh, com uh, companies which do this data flow process for you to get a uh, to clear the licensing exam part in uh, in the state of Kerala are like the most common ones are Gateway, Eurogulf. These people do it quite frequently, and uh, they are well known people for doing this, and they do a very good job in terms of uh, getting all those documents appropriately right and verifying it themselves and uploading it in the website. Uh, again, the timeline it differs dip, differs upon the situation and if the accuracy of all the documents and how you upload all those things and the clarity of the scan and all those things. These are basic things which is required when you upload. Once you have all these documents, it's just you have to approach one of these uh, good companies. It may not be these two which I mentioned. There could be many other companies and the requirement. Uh, this is the basic requirement plus or minus there may be things which uh, they will need in addition or sometimes some of the things may not be needed based on the place which you apply again remember what uh, the good standing certificate in this uh, as per the websites of the place you apply the validity changes so some places it may be valid for two to three months or six months depending upon the place you apply the authority the licensing authority website will have all those details so they keep changing this based on uh, how they uh, review their profile and uh, what they do is uh, they, they aware of how uh, what is the validity of all these uh, good standing stuff. suppose you got the good standing certificate from the council today it may be valid only for two or three months so make sure this is the last thing you apply and get from the council because some of the other things may be um, time constraining so once everything attestation everything is complete the last thing you get is the good standing certificate this can be applied through the pharmacy council webs, uh, website so it can be a quick one to a tatkal which could be uh, you get it within a couple of weeks or it comes by post in two weeks or three uh, weeks time uh, again, the timeline you have to check with the uh, state pharmacy council depending upon where it is. So th these are the basic requirements, documents required for applying for verification to appear for the exam. Now, coming on to exam preparation, this is something which is very uh, tedious and which is time consuming for depending upon the exam. So make sure you are going to practice in a country which is totally different. The education system is different. The practice system is totally different from when you take uh, when you consider your country. So when you apply outside the exams, some of the exams may be tough. Some of the exams may be a little bit lenient, but depending upon the practice uh, in that country or that region, it may vary. So nothing is uh, you. It's nothing is there that which cannot be achieved. Everything can be achieved. Only thing is the intensity in which they do the exams or the questions of the exams may be different based on the uh, place you apply. So these are the basic requirements. These are the requirements requirements for uh, one of the exams. If you see the exam preparation resources, uh, pharmacology is mostly from the Lippincott. So pharmacology is there from Lippincott for most of the exams and uh, pharmacotherapy handbook by Dipiro is a good resource for the uh, drug management or the pharmacotherapy management for uh, each disease wise condition and this applies for specifically for uh, the exams in the uh, in UAE and apart from that the other requirements are all uh, in general you can use these references or uh, these are the best references which they say in their website uh, the, all these are for the uh, Abu Dhabi examination Abu Dhabi licensing examination so uh, you need all exams, all the exams, licensing exams in any of these countries or region will basically have a pharmacology classification or dosing kind of question. That would be one part of the question. There would be pharmacotherapy plan. It may be case based or something like that. That would be one part. Uh, pharmaceutical calculations would be one part. So the good best reference for this would be Ansel's uh, pharmaceutical calculation. Apart from that, uh, pharmaceutics, the dosage forms, compounding, preparation, all these are important questions which can, can come. So the pharmaceutical part, the biopharmaceutics, all those things applies. And most of them say uh, can learn from Remington or uh, any of these books. So it, it could be Remington, Lippincott. These are the references they give. Whichever is comfortable, you feel information is same is more understandable in, in any other book. Make sure you cover the things in these uh, preparatory materials. Apart from that, 
the Abu Dhabi licensing exam uh, asks you to, uh, the, most of the questions may be case based. So that's why they're asking you to go through the uh, pharmaceutical care practice book. Uh, which is the, uh, the clinician's guide by Chipol. And uh, they also specify more in terms of drug information books. So it's not that you have to read all these books, you just have to understand how to handle a drug information query or uh, to un the knowing the monograph of the commonly used drugs. That is enough. It does not mean that the ASHP uh, formulary book, you have to read the whole big book. That's not needed. So it's just you understand uh, how to give a drug information and uh, you know the, the um, drug monograph of most commonly used drugs. This is what is basically a structure or the materials which you use for preparing for the exam. All this depends upon the exam you prepare for or uh, the severity of the exam. That is, if you look for Abu Dhabi exam, you may need all these resources. If you are looking for uh, the planning to take the exam in Dubai, it may be lesser than this, or the Ministry of Health exams in or the prometric exams in other countries like uh, Qatar, Oman and all, they may need only the pharmacology, the calculation and basic pharmaceutics. So it's, it, it may not have, you don't have to go in depth into case present, uh, case based presentation also. All this depends upon the region. So what, uh, so the thing is, exam proprietary resources and centers are available uh, in almost uh, most of the places in the country and in the region so you just have to go to them they will guide you this way if you're going to practice it yourself this is also a way you can gather these books plus they may also have a uh, question banks which uh, is their resource so you'll have to get it from them and try to uh, solve those questions so you practice those questions which gives you a better idea so if you complete a data flow process, the verification for all your documents which you submitted, and I've already shared the exam resources and told you how each of these uh, resources vary based on the exam. So next step is applying for the uh, exam. So applying for the exam, once you get the data flow verification is completed, they will give you a data flow certificate which says that you are eligible to take the exam. So that certificate is, is what is used to uh, go into the website and apply. So all this app applying for the exam is all done by the company itself. So if you're giving in all these doc appropriate documents to the company, they do all those uh, verification process, everything uh, by uh, up, uh, scanning and sending these documents appropriately. And once they you get the cleared certificate, that is the data flow clearance certificate, you upload that into any of these websites. So these are the web links where you will be able to see I'm just I've just put the common ones here. I've not covered all, all, all the countries and all the regions. So the common ones where people apply for the exam. So you have the Abu Dhabi exam. So previously it was not known as HAD, that is Health Authority of Abu Dhabi. The name has now changed to Department of Health. This is their web link. You'll have to go on to uh, professional qualification requirements and uh, the details will be there for how to apply for license and all those things. If it's Dubai, the website is uh, Dubai Health Authority, that is a DHA. If it's Qatar, it's Qatar Prometric. Uh, you have to go into Ministry of Public Health a state of Qatar website and go for the prometric exam. Again, uh, if it's Oman, uh, they also have the Ministry of Health pro exams as well. Uh, and again, uh, in UAE, there are seven Emirates, uh, two Emirates, that is Dubai and Abu Dhabi is covered. Any other Emirates, if it's Sharjah or any other place in, in UAE, they'd have to go for the MOH licensing process, that is Ministry of Health uh, licensing process, that is totally different. So how does the exam pattern vary? So it depends upon the number of questions, the duration of the exam. And if there is a, uh, most of these questions would be multiple choices, it would be computer based uh, uh, testing. So it is CBT testing, computer based testing. Once you clear that, some exams may have oral, uh, it may, oral exam testing would be there or Viva will be there. Depends upon which place you apply. Uh, say, like for example, you're taking uh, DOH, the Had Abu Dhabi, uh, the exams, you, the question pattern is like 100 questions would be there and it's two hours. The exam is two hours. And if it's clinical pharmacy, they will have a oral testing. That is Viva would be there if you pass the, once you clear the, uh, the multiple choice exam. So after that, there would be a viva. And after the viva, you, you, are, you get a eligibility letter for being a clinical pharmacist. 
if it's pharmacist then you only have to clear the multiple choice exam if it's dha it is only the multiple choice exam it, again that is 100 questions you have two and a half hours and all depends upon the place you apply and the region you apply so the passing score and all again depends upon the region and place you apply and it varies and that has to keep uh, that keeps updating sometimes based on uh, each of their requirements so like if you're taking doh mostly it is they don't have a kind of passing score but it's quite high and they do it based on percentile and uh, the cutoff is quite high for the doh exam and uh, if you're taking dha exam it is 60 percent 65 percent is the cutoff passing score and uh, 100 questions two and a half hours depending upon the region all these uh, number of questions uh, followed by uh, viva yes or no depends and so questions as i told you it all comes from calculations uh, the pharmaceutics biopharmaceutics and uh, pharmacotherapy classification pharmacology all these are uh, compounding uh, like uh, tpn calculations all these are questions which come in the uh, based on the uh, exam which you apply if if it's viva uh, specifically for the abu dhabi exam which has a viva they will have case based scenarios so that is quite a uh, thing is uh, when you apply for these exams when it's uh, when you clear the first part the multiple choice next is the viva exam it it is uh, usually it is in person now i think it's online and you'll have to also keep updated on how the process works so once you apply for the viva uh, you take the pick the dates for the exam uh, it has to be uh, they ask the questions they ask you is like uh, six case based scenarios where they ask you all the details of the uh, of the case so it could be uh, identifying the risk factors of the disease condition or you have to have a picture of what the disease is they may give you clues of the disease but they not say this exactly is the disease suppose they won't say it is um, say heart failure they would say these are the signs and symptoms patient came with or they won't say it is a myocardial infarction they will say these are the signs and symptoms patient came with these are the findings and what uh, what would you do so you have to first identify the risk factors know what the disease condition or the finding is then you have to recommend the pharmacotherapy and in between you'll have to also uh, go through the scoring systems like scoring system for each of uh, the disease condition may be there depending upon what pharmacotherapy you're going to start like suppose you're going to start uh, any uh, anticoagulation for a patient and the most common scoring system which is used is the uh, chadwa score or the has blood score chadwa score is to all these scoring systems are to assess which agent to give the risk of the mortality risk and the bleeding risk so based on this uh, you decide the pharmacotherapy the drugs which have to be, be given so like this in the viva they assess you based on case they give you a case scenario they'll ask you questions based on all these things like the risk factors scoring systems what your finding is based on patient symptoms and what is your plan for pharmacotherapy and they assess you by that along with that they also assess your knowledge in research uh, I, that is in terms of statistics and research so they ask you questions like odds ratio risk uh, relative risk and like basic statistics questions how do you apply give examples and all kind of things like that so these are some uh, viva questions or like pattern in which they ask for the abu dhabi exam apart from that if there is no viva exam the dubai health authority dha uh, they don't have a viva exam so it's for pharmacists and clinical pharmacists it's only multiple choice exam so again depending upon which country and which region all these changes and uh, th this is the whole process so after you clear either if it's only multiple choice exam you clear that you or if it has a viva you clear that and you, after completion of uh, these licensing exams you pass or you clear that you get an eligibility letter so with this letter you can apply for a job so this is the letter which you get ultimately after all these process to have a get a job in the in the middle east or the gulf region so with this paper what you are supposed to do is you can apply for jobs online come to the country and search all these things so apart from that if you see all these can be done if it's only multiple choice exam it uh, you have sent testing centers in india in uh, every state so it is you can take the exam in a country itself without uh, leaving your job being in the job getting a still working uh, certificate you can clear all these and then you can e either apply online 
through the hospital portal websites from the country or you can come here and apply so until then you can keep your job you don't have to uh, leave your job and do all these things preparation for the exam can be done in between as well all up to you and they have testing coaching centers where they do, they do uh, tests and they help you out sort things as well so these are basic things which you can do from the country if viva currently it's online uh, but i'm not sure if you can attend from the outside the country but previously it was in uh, in direct interview and it has to be inside the country they have to be here in person and that was one thing for the viva and uh, all these things keep changing so always remember look the updated things on the website or the person who does this for you may definitely know all these details so these are basic things and uh, next thing is applying for a job which can definitely be done online from your country or if you are here in the region you can come and do that or you can uh, up, uh, do it through a you come with a visit visa you can apply a job through that you only need the eligibility letter now because you've already cleared all those remaining documents so what are the opportunities for pharmacists in the middle east so there are a lot of opportunities just how you apply for the opportunity how you've prepared yourself for the opportunity so it's it's not just clearing the exam and coming here it's always clear, clearing the exam and making sure that you have the knowledge and skill to apply for the post so when they do an interview or when they assess your uh, curriculum vitae they, what they look at is all now have you done a lot what have you done in the profession how eligible are you how how do you qualify for the vacancy so all these are things in which they look at so it's not just having the experience just pulling off and coming here and working it's the skills you acquire during your college and when you're working these are very important so it's not just somehow finishing the uh, pharmacy school applying for a job somehow completing two years without uh, knowing any uh, in, any much general information and coming here does not make sense it's all about knowing it better and uh, always remember uh, having that skill and knowledge makes a big difference when you apply for positions here because I, i would be discussing about the challenges in the next slide so you'll understand why so the opportunities you have here is uh, as pharmacists in the middle east is a uh, community pharmacy a setting can uh, be a good one ambulatory pharmacy setting in the in a hospital setting or inpatient uh, pharmacy setting uh, in a hospital uh, it could be a, a clinical pharmacist in a specialty based setting or a general clinical pharmacy setting uh, antibiotic uh, stewardship pharmacist which is there in some of the hospitals specifically for antibiotics uh, it could be a uh, quality and medication safety pharmacist they look into pharmacovigilance patient safety aspects uh, quality in terms of accreditation and all those basic compliance and again as a pharmacist you need to equip to the next level so you have to have a quite some knowledge in sterile compounding and preparation sometimes uh, along with the other pharmacist jobs you may have to even do compounding and preparation and that would be an additional uh, job along that or it could be a separate job where you a portion where you do specifically sterile compounding and preparations like for example if you take oncology oncology chemotherapy medications are prepared in a sterile uh, way by a pharmacist so all these are open opportunities for, so how do you apply is the most important thing and how do you equip yourself to apply is the next most important thing it's not just uh, having the knowledge and skills but always it's the attitude and multiple other factors which comes along with when you apply so there are plenty of opportunities along with that there are challenges and risks as well so how do you overcome that is what i'm going to discuss now it's not you are not the only person who's going to apply for the job here so people from all the other foreign countries uh, in in the region will come here and apply pharmacy graduates who qualify from the country who pass out from the country apply here so that's the most important part how do you equip yourself to bring up here starts from pharmacy school uh, you equip yourself very well uh, when you practice as a clinical pharmacist and uh, then you apply i'm sure uh, all that will take you to the next level so 
all this the package the salary package the hospital you get all these is all customized based on the individual so if you ask me a question what is the salary package i can give you a wide range it starts from this 1 to 10 but that does not make sense all that depends upon the individual and what job you get is also depending upon the individual you could get a job as an ambulatory care pharmacist or community pharmacist or a clinical pharmacist in the, in the specialty or someone who uh, works in antibiotic stewardship the thing is uh, w- if you get it or not all this depends upon the experience or the knowledge you acquired from the workplace you've uh, done before so all this matters when you apply so coming on to a couple of things so all these websites which i mentioned have uh, details of the farmd program in the middle east uh, there are many more than this i've just picked up few region wise and if you go on to these websites you can see the curriculum in that so each every country have their own pharmacy colleges their uh, their pharmacy uh, program the doctor pharmacy program or the masters in clinical pharmacy are all very well developed so thing is uh, so these curriculum if you go on to these website they'll have their whole course description each semester wise which is classified and what all are the uh, rotations they uh, give for their students so remember all these students pass out and they come into the uh, hunt, job hunt so thing is for all these students who passed out from the region so for example if you're taking uh, U- uae uh, as as a country uh, if someone who's uh, passed out from a pharmacy school uh, a farmd program or any clinical pharmacy program they can do 6 months of internship and they qualify for the exam so think uh, when you're coming from a foreign country uh, you have two years of experience then you qualify for exam but a person here who uh, because why they've customized it this way is because they're completing six months of internship uh, after their uh, qualification post qualification plus uh, they have uh, the experience of a clinical pharmacist working with the team during their curriculum during the internship or uh, during their course activity or all these things this is, this is what makes them qualify for the next uh, level and uh, for them six months of uh, internship is enough for them to apply for the exam so basically uh, the farmd program if you go into these you'll get more details of how and all uh, are placed in the system and you'll be i find the differences of how the rotations works and why only six months is enough for these in addition to these they have pharmacy residency program so pharmacy residency program is pgy1 and they some of the places have pgy2 this is ashp accredited pharmacy residency program so these are things which uh, gives you more qualifications in terms of clinical practice so if you go on to these websites it gives you details of what rotations are there uh, what are the exposure that uh, the resident gets uh, in detail these are uh, add up so all these residents pharmacy graduates pass out and they are in and ready to practice along with the people from outside the country so these are the environment in which you're going to find a job so how do you equip yourself to come to this environment is the most important thing so you'll have to just basically go through all these things to get an idea of how things work one important question i get is can i do a pharmacy residency program after i complete my pharmd or get any pharmacy qualification from india currently uh, all these residency program are restricted to local people uh, who are either uh, who are uh, pa- graduating from the pharmacy colleges in the in the country so if someone who's passed out from the country uh, from the pharmacy schools in the country they give them the opportunity to apply for residency it depends upon the institution which they apply and the region they apply some of the countries or regions they only hospitals they only give for the uh, locals over there the nationals of that country now, or uh, some con- uh, some hospitals they give for uh, other nationals as well but they should be graduating from the uh, country itself from uh, suppose if you're taking uae they should be graduating from uae itself it could be national or non national but graduating from uae so this is the difference so if you are coming from uh, our country uh, you may not be able to apply for res- residency here because this is the criteria for them to uh, eligibility for the residency program 
so way forward how to overcome these are you will have to develop your skill sets upgrade your skill sets these are few things so what i've added here are things apart from the knowledge you can acquire so you'll have to have uh, development skills in research publication informatel information technology being more digital communication skills should be very good when you approaching each of any of these um, professionals in and in your, your colleagues as well the attitude towards the profession should be very good leadership and administration uh, uh, you should have all those skills in as well when you come from there quality and patient safety aspects should be there as well in your skill sets these are things which you'll have to develop apart from the knowledge uh, things you uh, knowledge and upgrading skills which you have to get so these are basic things which would definitely add to uh, you, make you better when you apply here along with that if you uh, are it's an investment of doing being specialized in a, in a clinical pharmacy specialty if you're completing both pharmacy specialties then it's, it is an added advantage because they may prefer you based on the jobs you apply and uh, based on your qualification like what are you looking for and your background of clinical pharmacy you provide in the country and always remember knowledge and skill in applying the pharmacotherapy you've learned is very important so these and all will add and will pick up pick you up in getting a better job a better better package in a be good hospital when you are coming to practice so all this will take you into the next level so i've done with my presentation the take home message is very simple uh, you you can start uh, now right away in the pharmacy school or if you are working now you can start from there itself but always be goal oriented have a target in your mind and know your career options uh, based on the current demand so what specialty what uh, clinical pharmacy things you have to do after you pass out should be there and make sure updating your knowledge learning more it should be a continuous process it should not stop after your pharmacy school or you got you got a job in your country okay i should stop learning i just practice finish off those two years or if you're coming into the other country uh, that is middle east or gulf region your knowledge updation should also be continuing and it should be a continuous process so that's basically the take home message which i would like to share and thank you everyone for being patient listeners and uh, this is my uh, email address if you have any questions or you need the slides for the hyperlinks i can send you the slides and you can definitely ask me questions now or uh, you can ask me questions uh, after the session as well through email and uh, thank you so much for being listeners thank you thank you dr mohammad hisham for that wonderful presentation i'm sure that most of our students have made benefited from your presentation there's just one question uh, which has come are there any hospital pharmacists which do compounding of drugs pharmaceutical preparations in the uae yes so that's a very good question so some compounding and sterile preparation is something which we've not practiced in a country so it is only restricted of chemotherapy so in most of the full fledged hospitals which have a they have a very good compounding and sterile preparation room the drugs are not prepared the iv drugs are not prepared Uh, on the floors it is prepared in the pharmacy then goes to the floors so all these iv could be chemotherapy or any iv medication if it's a bag or a syringe it is prepared in the pharmacy something which is like a powder dissolved and just a push uh, depending upon the drug drug it is prepared on the floors and emergency situations also it's prepared on the floors apart from that 90 to 95% of the drugs iv drugs are prepared in the pharmacy and this is not there in most of the hospitals here but still there in uh, very few hospitals in the region and uh, pharmacists play a very important role in compounding and sterile preparation so this is something which you have to get the skill from home when you come here because that will add advantage uh, some of the uh, job profiles they ask you along with clinical pharmacy uh, job profile they ask you in addition to that do you have compounding and preparation skills especially calculation for tpn and preparing tpn uh, total parental nutrition preparing that and calculation for that all this it's specifically asked by some of the uh, uh, employers so they ask you for these if your knowledge in that you do that it's very and good so thing is in india i think chemotherapy is most commonly done by pharmacist in majority of the hospitals and um, 
Apart from that, uh, the uh, if you look for TPN and parental nutrition, it's done in pediatric and neonatal ICUs, uh, if it is not pre-mixed. And uh, apart from that, all the other medications are done bedside by the nurse. But here in a few hospitals, uh, like you take 25 to 30 percent of the hospitals, which are very good and which have very good clinical pharmacy services, they have this comp sterile compounding and preparation in the pharmacy itself. So this has been overdone, overlooked and done by pharmacists. I hope I answered the question. Thank you for answering that question. There's another question from Anthony Daniel. He says that most of the countries in the UAE, they prefer citizens from their own country and what is the way in which we can overcome them? Okay. I think that is also a fairly good question, but I think I've answered that on my slides. So the, uh, what they want through getting uh, their own nationals, their own locals is they want to invest on them for the future of the country. So it's not that they don't want you guys, but definitely there's always a role where you can pop up. Any of the professions from any country can pop up if they have the skill, the, the skills I told you. In addition, definitely you need the knowledge, knowledge on pharmacotherapy, basic drugs and uh, basic, basic patient care is something which is definitely a benchmark. You need to be having that. Apart from that, uh, you'll have to uh, get all the additional skills which makes you and puts you into the profession so that even if someone else is there, uh, you still have an opportunity there. Definitely, they are. They have a vision for the future, and that's the reason why they uh, prefer locals. But still, it does not mean that there is no opportunity for expats who come from outside and want practice here. There are still opportunities. Thank you. There's another one question from Hima Sabu. She says, "Can we work as trained pharmacists for two years in the UAE after the graduation from India and get the exams cleared after that?" Okay, so this is something which is a good question, which is raised by multiple of them even before this webinar. So this question, as you asked me, trainee pharmacist. The trainee pharmacist, there's something uh, behind that as well. So when you apply for a trainee pharmacist job, it would be definitely a pharmacist job. And that would be, it's like a pharmacy technician job where you do all those things, uh, like uh, what you call stockpiling. Uh, all. So it, there won't be anything most of the time they won't be anything related to uh, what you call uh, direct patient care but at some some depending upon the hospital and the place some of them offer very good direct patient care they give you opportunity to approach as per the laws here only if you have a license you can approach a patient or you can give direct patient care without that they may not be allowing you to give a license again depending upon the facility you apply they may have some rules and restrictions in that in assistance with a pharmacist who has license, you can do a trainee pharmacist. The something which is there behind the trainee pharmacist is two things. One is either you get two years of very good experience from your country and come here. That would definitely make a big difference in the job you apply or uh, the package you get or the hospital you apply or the, the what do you call the dream job you want to get in this country. Second is being a pharm trainee pharmacist here does not mean that it's the end of the road. Uh, being a trainee pharmacist here would definitely fetch your job, but it may not be fetching your job which you dreamt of or a salary package which you dreamt of. Because when you are, as a trainee pharmacist, you have a lot of restrictions and uh, you bulk of the job would be kind of a technician job where you're trying to get the medications from the shelf. And that is also a pharmacist job. But the uh, thing is, uh, that would be the majority of the job. That would not add to your clinical experience. Or when you come to the pool of job hunt, you may not be a different person from the others. So they prefer others who have very good experience and good exposure from that. That is the only thing behind the training pharmacist and getting experience from the country. That is an option where you can apply. Some of them, uh, they give you license to practice after that, depending all this depends upon the facilities. Make sure you read the norms and uh, properly the documents which, which they give you before you apply for the trainee pharmacy job. Thank you, sir. Uh, we do not see any more questions here. I'm sure that has surely benefit the, benefited the students. It's nice hearing from you. Thank you once again. Thank you. For the next session, I would like to invite Mr. Naveen Panikar, 
Associate Professor, Department of Pharmacy Practice, to take over. Over to Naveen, sir. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Jenny, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Hisham. It was nice hearing from you. Now, good evening, all. We are in the third part of the webinar series being conducted by St. Joseph College of Pharmacy. Uh, I'm sure you would have all benefited from all the talks that you have heard throughout the series. Uh, I would like to add that we have a few more talks coming in the next few days. So please do join us and I'm sure you will get benefited from it. Right. So now continuing with our today's program, uh, I would like to introduce with great pride the next speaker, Dr. Vrinda Nambudri from Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. Now a brief about her. She is a clinical research pharmacist in an ESRC, that is the Economic and Social Research Council funded project uh, in collaboration with Imperial College London. She also plays an important role in the antibiotic stewardship program at Amrita. She is the recipient of Bill and Melinda Gates Young Investigator Award for the research selected at 19th International Congress on Infectious Diseases. She was also awarded a travel grant by London School of Hygiene and Tropical okay. Medicine to attend the symposium conducted in London in 2018. She has been invited for many talks in different institutions. She has a number of presentations and publications to her name. She has attended many prestigious conferences and workshops. And in fact, recently she was in Cape Town, South Africa for a symposium. And she's also uh, responsible for organizing many important gatherings at Amrita. Now, these were all the official parts. On a personal note, uh, I have found her to be a very studious, hardworking, sincere student in our college days. And we are all happy that she is successful and we expect her to go up the ladder and become more successful. So eagerly awaiting for those days, Brinda. Okay, now for the young pharmacists over there who are watching this program, I can tell you she's a role model whom you can emulate. So do listen to her carefully and I'm sure you will get benefited. Dr. Brinda? They're all yours, please. Thank you, sir. So I'll just share my slide first. So uh, good evening to one and all. Uh, so. This is the second time that I've been uh, invited to uh, St. Joseph College of Pharmacy to speak to the students. Uh, so thank you so much, Naveen, sir, for that very sweet introduction. It feels great when uh, your teachers say such good things about you and they say that they are proud of what you have done. That means a lot to me. And uh, so uh, I'm very thankful uh, to the organizing committee of this program for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak to the students on emerging opportunities for PharmD graduates in India. And uh, before I begin my presentation, I would like to say a special thanks to uh, Siddhi sir for always having uh, supported and encouraged me in all my endeavors, uh, even during my college life, as well as after I graduated till now. Thank you so much, sir. And to all the teachers uh, in the college of, uh, in St. Joseph's College for giving me this opportunity. So, uh, all of you, I mean, many of you would be at that juncture in your uh, student life where you are a bit confused about what career option you want to choose after you have graduated and completed uh, the PharmD program. And I would like to appreciate uh, the organizers of this webinar series for giving an opportunity to the uh, students to explore what are the different career opportunities across the world and for having invited eminent speakers from different parts of the world to speak to the students. So uh, mostly by the time you uh, get towards the end of your course, the first question that you have is whether you want to stay within India or you want to move abroad. So uh, either for your uh, stud uh, higher studies or to take up a job in these countries. So if you decide to go abroad from what I have seen, 
these are the uh, major areas or major countries that uh, farm d graduates generally choose and you have already listened to uh, very eminent speakers from many of these countries who spoke before me regarding the opportunities in these countries so the focus of uh, my presentation today would be to discuss about a uh, few emerging uh, career opportunities for farm d graduates and my focus would be in india and so basically i would be uh, discussing uh, uh, or rather just sharing my experience uh, of working as a clinical pharmacist in india so as many of you know uh, the farmd program was introduced in india in the year 2008 and in 2010 it was introduced in kerala so right now we are in 2020 so it's almost 10 years or a decade has passed since the farmd program was introduced in kerala so has anything changed right from 2010 to 2020 in the span of 10 years has anything changed uh, with regards to the recognition that the clinical pharmacists get in kerala the job opportunities etc so i feel that that's my personal opinion that i'm saying that it has definitely changed because i was a student of the uh, first batch of farmd in kerala so when i joined this uh, program in 2020, uh, 2010 not many people even in the uh, medical field knew about the farmd program or what the job of a clinical pharmacist would be from that to now many of the doctors are uh, well aware about this program and the responsibilities that can be handled by a clinical pharmacist and it is uh, very interesting to note that many of the doctors are actually demanding the presence of a clinical pharmacist in their team and which because of which many uh, farmd graduates are getting opportunities within care life itself so if uh, so to talk about the uh, broad areas of interest for farmd graduates uh, within india the basic uh, areas would include a clinical pharmacy industry research and academia so the uh, speakers before me have already covered some of these areas so i'll be focusing uh, more about some of the emerging opportunities in uh, clinical pharmacy and uh, in research so if you decide to take up a career in uh, clinical pharmacy these are some of the uh, common uh, departments that uh, uh, employ clinical pharmacists it's not restricted to this list definitely it is not restricted to this i'm just saying uh, these are more or less the uh, major or the most commonly uh, common uh, departments that employ clinical pharmacists and uh, the responsibilities that you handle in each of these departments might slightly vary depending on which department you are working in but to uh, the basic uh, responsibilities would include uh, these uh, few ones so you would be responsible to uh, detect medication errors uh, to ensure the medications are reconciled well to uh, identify report uh, adverse drug reactions the detection and prevention of drug interactions answering drug related queries providing patient counseling etc so in my next few slides i would like to discuss uh, with you about a, a very new emerging uh, area for clinical pharmacists in india and that's the antimicrobial stewardship program so uh, antimicrobial stewardship program is basically uh, a set of coordinated activities that uh, has been uh, implemented with an aim to rationalize the use of antibiotics thereby reducing uh, the unnecessary cost reducing the resistance to antibiotics but uh, enhancing the patient health outcomes so this is broadly what a stewardship program does so it is basically to ensure that the antibiotics are prescribed rationally with uh, keeping in mind that it is not giving any unnecessary cost to the patient but enhancing their healthcare outcomes so uh, the role of pharmacists and the uh, the impact of an antimicrobial stewardship program in a hospital has been well studied and well published from across the world so i have taken just a few publications here that show uh, the role of pharmacist in a stewardship program so uh, to just explain uh, what the stewardship program is and what is the role of a clinical pharmacist in such a program i would like to just walk you through uh, the uh, stewardship program at our hospital that is amrita institute of medical sciences so the antibiotic stewardship program in the hospital was uh, 
implemented in uh, February 2016. So right from its inception, uh, there was a uh, involvement from uh, the clinical pharmacist, as well as there was very defined responsibilities and role for a clinical pharmacist. So I started my career as a clinical pharmacist in the antimicrobial stewardship program at Amrita. So this is just giving you a snapshot of the daily workflow of the stewardship program here. So if you can see, the clinical pharmacists are the key drivers of this program. So they play a very, very important role right from uh, collecting the details of patients on reserved antimicrobials to evaluating uh, each prescription to assess if it is appropriate to discuss these uh, with the uh, doctors in the stewardship team to uh, to communicate the recommendations from the stewardship team to the uh, primary team of the patient, to follow up these recommendations, to see if the recommendations have been complied by the primary team, and to monitor the patient until discharge to uh, see if there are any opportunities for uh, de-escalation or escalation of therapy. So the uh, stewardship program has evolved over these last few years. And this evolving profile of uh, the stewardship program has also given more and more opportunities to uh, clinical pharmacists and has uh, employed many more clinical pharmacists in the program. So when the stewardship program started, I was the only pharmacist who was employed in, in this program. But I'm very proud to say that uh, right now we have about uh, five clinical pharmacists uh, who are working either fully or uh, are involved in one or two projects related to stewardship in our team. So right now, uh, so even though the stewardship program at Amrita uh, started as an antibiotic stewardship program by just reviewing the appropriateness of uh, three reserved antimicrobials, it evolved over time to initiate an antifungal stewardship, an antituberculous stewardship, a separate pediatric stewardship. In addition to uh, giving clinical responsibilities uh, to the pharmacists, they were also exposed to uh, various research activities. So some of these research activities were uh, in hospital quality improvement initiatives, while some were uh, in collaboration with various national and international institutions. And in addition to working in research projects, the, uh, pharmac the clinical pharmacist and the team were also encouraged to write research proposal, to uh, contribute to research publications, as well as to present their work at various national and international conferences. So to talk in a nutshell about uh, what the role of a clinical pharmacist is in a stewardship program, I would say it is a leadership role by sharing accountability, the promotion of optimal antimicrobial use to decrease the unintended consequences of antimicrobial use and to maximize the patient outcomes. Coming to the responsibilities that are handled by clinical pharmacists in a stewardship program, uh, as I mentioned in one of the previous slides, uh, the stewardship program basically aims to rationalize the use of antibiotics in the hospital. So you all have learned uh, what is rational drug use. So it is giving the right drug to the right patient at the right dose frequency for the right duration of time. So the same principle applies to a stewardship program as well. So the first responsibility of a clinical pharmacist is to ensure that the uh, selected antibiotic is the appropriate one for the patient. So that depends upon uh, what is the focus of infection or where the infection is for that patient, uh, the drug availability. Sometimes what uh, you need to prescribe might not be available in your hospital. So you need to make sure that the drug is available or what would be the best possible uh, alternative uh, to the recommended drug. So these are some of the uh, responsibilities that needs to be handled by a pharmacist. The next is individualized dosing. I think uh, many of you have been uh, trained in uh, dosage calculations as a part of your clinical post trains. So when you uh, prescribe a dose for a patient, you need to make sure that it is adjusted based on the patient's age, body weight. It could be the organ function, especially when you're giving hepatotoxic or nephrotoxic drugs, etc. The next is IV to oral conversion. So to see if there are any opportunities to change a parenteral uh, formulation to an oral formulation. So I think this is again something that you all are doing and I don't need to go much into detail here. The next is uh, de-escalation, escalation and stopping of antibiotics. So for example, uh, especially sometimes uh, the doctors prescribe antibiotics empirically. 
So in those cases, they do not have a culture report to guide the antibiotic selection. But instead, they would be choosing an antibiotic uh, that could be based on an institutional guideline or the antibiogram in the hospital, etc. And before they administer the antibiotic to the patient, they would have sent a culture uh, uh, to the microbiology lab. At times, what happens is that the doctors tend to forget that they have sent a culture. And uh, in that case, uh, they miss to follow up on the culture reports. So in those cases, the antibiotics would be con con uh, continued unnecessarily for a prolonged time. So there, as a pharmacist, what you can do is uh, vigilantly monitor uh, once the culture has been sent, make sure that you follow up the culture reports to ensure that the given antibiotic is the correct one for the patient. So sometimes what happens is that uh, you might have started the patient on uh, PIPTAS, that is the present tazobactam, but your uh, culture report shows a multi-drug resistant organism, which would be sensitive only to say meropenem or colistin. In those cases, you would have to escalate the antibiotic to those higher anti antibiotics. So you can suggest that. At times, you might have started the patient on a meropenem, but the culture report shows that uh, it is uh, sensitive to lower antibiotics like uh, your magnex or PIPTAS. And in those cases, what you need to do is you need to de-escalate the therapy if the patient uh, is clinically stable. So these are some uh, responsibilities that uh, where the pharmacists pay, play a very key role. The next is uh, doing clinical and economic analysis of uh, the stewardship program. So as a part of the stewardship program, you're collecting large amount of data. And uh, as a pharmacist, it is very important that you analyze this data to see uh, what are the outcomes of your stewardship program. So uh, the economic outcomes uh, would include, uh, you can either do a you know, cost analysis, like a cost benefit or a cost minimization analysis to see after the implementation of the stewardship program in your hospital, has there been any benefit to the patient? Or um, you can do simple cost calculation by just looking at the cost of the antimicrobial. Look at the consumption of antibiotics before the stewardship program was implemented and look at the consumption after the stewardship program and see if there has been any decrease. So if there has been a decrease in the antimicrobial consumption, it definitely means that you have uh, reduced the unnecessary cost for the patient. So you can do those kinds of analysis and see the outcomes of a stewardship program. If you look at the clinical outcomes, you can look into the clinical failures or the clinical cure rates after you have uh, made an intervention to the patient. So these are some of the broad responsibilities that uh, the clinical pharmacist in a stewardship program does. Uh, so all these responsible responsibilities are done by the clinical pharmacist in our team. But in addition to that, they have taken up a lot of initiatives apart from their uh, routine clinical work. So the pharmacists in our program are uh, very much involved in the preparation of dosing guidelines for uh, reserved antimicrobials in the hospital. This is another initiative that uh, they have, uh, in, they have uh, come up with. Um, so the hospital did have a nearly updated antibiogram, uh, but it was not a department and a body fluid specific one. So the clinical pharmacist in the team took the initiative to do a department as well as a body fluid specific antibiogram. And they have been, uh, in, uh, they have been leading this uh, initiative since the last two years. So this is another initiative that uh, they have done that is preparation of an IV dilution protocol for reserved antibiotics that require a loading dose, reserve antimicrobials that require a loading dose. So this was basically for the uh, nurses in our hospital. So these guidelines uh, or this protocol was prepared by the uh, clinical pharmacist in our team and was disseminated to the nurses uh, across the hospital. So this is another key initiative uh, that is done by the clinical pharmacist in our team. So uh, that is the therapeutic drug monitoring of uh, antibiotics that have a narrow therapeutic index. So. Uh, you might have already studied about uh, what uh, therapeutic drug monitoring is. That is uh, to look at the drug levels in the blood of antibiotics which have a narrow therapeutic index. That is, if you slightly increase the dose, it might go into a toxic level. And if you slightly decrease the dose, it might go into a therapeutic level. 
so it is very important that uh, for these kind of drugs you uh, monitor the drug levels of the uh, antibiotic in the blood and ensure that it is uh, maintained in that uh, recommended range and the pharmacists in our hospital are uh, keen, are uh, very much involved in this initiative so when the service uh, was implemented in our hospital as the first step uh, the clinical pharmacist in our team prepared a guideline or a protocol for the therapeutic drug monitoring so that uh, gave uh, information about uh, when all the blood samples needs to be drawn how the dosage needs to be calculated according to the uh, drug levels etc in addition to that currently they are also uh, in charge of, they also monitor all the patients across the hospital who are on these antibiotics these narrow therapeutic uh, index antibiotics and make sure that uh, the drug levels uh, the blood samples are sent to, uh, to check the drug levels as well as the um, dose administered is adequate as per the drug level so the uh, we have also uh, gradually uh, start uh, started implementing a diagnostic stewardship program in our hospital so we are still in the initial steps uh, and as a uh, first initiative uh, we have uh, tried to modify the uh, microbiology culture sending form so this is the this is the form that is sent along with the culture specimen to the microbiology lab so we modified the form to include a section to give what was the indication for sending uh, the uh, the the culture sample so this was an initiative uh, which we did uh, quite recently and we are also auditing the compliance to this form to see what are the uh, common indications for which you sent a blood culture whether it was a, a rational decision to do that or whether it was inappropriate and that is done for different uh, specimens so we are still in the initial stages and uh, so it's quite a new intervention that we are, have implemented in our hospital so in these uh, past few slides what i have tried to show you is that the um, pharmacist in our team did not actually stick on to just the uh, clinical responsibilities that they were given they tried to explore uh, various other options in which they can expand their uh, knowledge as well as uh, create a better recognition for them in the hospital so uh, these were some of these examples uh, that uh, are, have been initiated by the uh, pharmacist in our program and as i mentioned in one of my uh, previous slides the uh, pharmacists here are also exposed to a lot of research activities and uh, they are encouraged to get involved in research projects as well as uh, write research publications research grants etc so in the next few slides i'll be talking about having a career in research in a clinical setting after a pharmd program so as i mentioned i started off my career as a clinical pharmacist in the stewardship program so uh, initially when i started one of the major challenges that i faced was uh, understanding what was understanding the prescribing behavior or the prescribing pattern of certain departments in the hospital and it was all the more difficult to uh, make them comply to the uh, recommendations that the stewardship team is giving and it was always uh, i it was already always a bit uh, puzzled i was always a bit puzzled to see how do they decide which antibiotic to give because i was not able to get a rational judgment there so that is uh, when i met a phd scholar uh, from imperial college in london who i would say literally changed my career path because uh, when i interacted with her uh, she talked extensively about qualitative research that was very new to me because i was not uh, very much aware about qualitative research and unfortunately qualitative research is not given much importance in our curriculum also so she spoke about how qualitative research is done how it is used in healthcare settings and it was very interesting and fascinating for me and one catch phrase uh, that she said and that still stays with me is that qualitative research enables a researcher to explore why do people behave the way they do and that was exactly what i wanted to know why do these doctors prescribe this antibiotic the way they do so uh, i really got fascinated and interested in qualitative research and i started uh, reading up uh, about qualitative research through various publications from different parts of the world so i've just given a few examples of uh, qualitative research in antibiotic stewardship related projects 
and i was very surprised to see that in the, in other countries qualitative research is done so extensively and uh, there are uh, and uh, it, it was very fascinating to know that uh, you know the results that a qualitative research uh, uh, brings out because that that is very different from what you get from a quantitative research because it is look it will look at the behavioral aspect of the study participants and uh, why do they do the way they do etc and that was very interesting for me so uh, after about uh, one and a half years of working fully in the antibiotic stewardship program i got an opportunity to work uh, in an economic and social research uh, council in uk funded uh, social science project uh it is called the aspires project this project is led by imperial college in london in collaboration with various uh, renowned institutions from across the world so this was a called uh, this was a social science study and this uh, project gave me a lot of opportunity to explore qualitative research to study more about it and to even to even do qualitative research in our hospital so these are some of the skills that i have gained to working in an international project for the past two you know two years so as i said qualitative research is one skill that i believe i've gained after working in this project so uh, they the team that we have from london imperial college they uh, they were very particular to uh, build capacity within the team at amrita to make sure that even after they leave uh, we continue the work and uh, without their help so they gave us extensive training for uh, we had like a one to one training for about 6 months initially and then at each point they help us in uh, exploring more to learn more about qualitative research and it has actually opened a wide range of opportunities for me the next one is research governance i think that is uh, it is very important whenever you are in a research project uh, to ensure that uh, all the regulations and ethical aspects of the project are uh, complied to so right from getting uh, an ethics committee approval to making sure that the uh, adequate consent forms are signed from the patient it is very important that you comply to these requirements so uh, ours was a qualitative research where we had a lot of observations and interviews of uh, study participants who were either patients or healthcare professionals in our hospital so the our supervisors from uh, imperial college they were very particular that uh, we comply to all the recommend uh, all the recommended uh, regulatory guidelines and make sure that uh, the participants who are invited to this project uh, come on a voluntary basis and uh, the information that we gather are stored anonymously and uh, we don't share it with uh, any third party without uh, the patient's approval so even if we collect patient data even if uh, we share it with the team in london we completely anonymize it so if you see our excel sheets you won't see an mrd number or a patient's age or sex uh, all those patient identifiable data are completely masked and it is only available to the researchers that are available in this hospital so these things i learned and the importance of these things to uh, protect the patient's identity or the participant's identity these things i learned after i uh, started working in this project or rather the importance of these things i learned uh, after uh, i started working in this project the next one is project management so since i was the first uh, researcher to be recruited for this project in amrita i had a lot of project management responsibilities so uh, this range from uh, making sure that all the deadlines are met the timeline is maintained uh, to training new recruits who join our project to make sure making sure that uh, we conduct regular meetings with the uk team the minutes of these meetings are shared with everyone so all these things i uh, had to uh, manage in uh, while uh, the team from uk remotely managed it so this was a new learning experience for me because i had not managed uh, a project that was this huge so i didn't do it alone uh, but a lot of management skills i could gather after working in this project the next was uh, presenting research works so uh, the aspires project that i'm and the, that i'm working on had a great focus on capacity building and uh, they spent uh, extensive amount of time in training uh, the researchers at amrita uh, to 
uh, gain, to develop skills in presentation as well as in writing uh, research uh, works. So these are two uh, areas that have improved a lot for me after working in this project. So uh, for presentation, uh, they give you training about how to prepare the slides, right, from the font that you choose, the font style, font size, the colors that you use, how to use uh, diagrams, how many points that you need to include in a slide to uh, making sure that uh, you don't add unnecessary pictures to your uh, slide without the right uh, copyright, uh, or with the, without the right permissions from the publisher. All these things uh, they were very particular about and they make sure that we comply to these. And that has given me a lot of training. In addition to that, uh, research writing and publication was a skill uh, that I would say I literally developed after I got into this project because I was a person who is more uh, who is more interested in speaking rather than writing. I would say, so uh, uh, my HOD, uh, the HOD of pharmacy practice uh, at Amrita, uh, while I was studying Emmanuel sir, he used to say that uh, whatever is not documented is equivalent to not being done. And I think that in a research field, that is very important because there are so many research works happening across the world. And unless and until you publish your work, you don't get recognition for what you did. And uh, it is very important that whatever little you do, make sure that you try and publish it in good journals and uh, reputed journals. So you don't need to cook up data and uh, uh, just for the sake of getting a publication, you don't need to publish it make sure that the project that you do is uh, valid and uh, the findings are uh, valid and then publish it in a reputed journal. So these things, uh, these skills are what I gained after working in this project. So these are some uh, collaborations that uh, we have with different universities from across the world. Uh, so this is just uh, the collaborations that we have in our department. There are many more happening in other departments in the hospital. So what I would like to highlight here is that each of these projects, they have a different aim, they have a different uh, research question. Uh, although most of it uh, are around infection control and antimicrobial stewardship program. So the training that you get in each of these projects will also differ. So some uh, research projects, uh, they focus more on uh, developing data collection skills or data analysis skills in their research uh, researchers. Some uh, like our project, they also uh, do a lot of capacity building in us to also present our work, to publish our work, etc. So depending on which research project you join, what you gain will also change. So to just summarize, uh, these are some of the skills that I think uh, is needed if you are planning a career in a research field. So one is definitely a passion to learn because uh, the research project that you work in may not be uh, dealing with something that you have already learned. For example, in my case, I was uh, uh, I am doing a project in qualitative research, something which I had never learned before. But you should have the passion to, and you should be open to those opportunities and think that uh, uh, you have got an opportunity to learn more and explore those options rather than saying that I've not learned, learned this, I don't know how to do this. So those kind of attitudes, I would say, is, is a very bad or a very negative uh, attitude. So make sure that you are open to learn and to explore more, read more about it, understand more about it. The next is time management. Um, I think uh, for any job profession, time management is extremely important. And so is the case with the research career. So uh, in research, you have to uh, publish your data. You, there's a great role for publishing your data to presenting your work. So many of these conferences, or if you're writing research grants, everything would have a deadline. So it is very important that you meet this deadline. In addition to that, many of these research projects would be funded and they would have received funding for only that stipulated time. Some research projects would only be for one year, some will be for three years, four years like that. And uh, the funding that they receive would be only for that amount of time. So it is very important that uh, you complete what has been assigned to you on time so that you don't need to extend your project beyond the recommended time. The next is uh, having an ability to work independently as well as in a team. So when you are working in a collaborative research, uh, especially, you will need to uh, have a good team dynamics and a good rapport with other members of your team 
within the hospital and uh, even if you are doing a collaborative work with other hospitals make sure that you have a good rapport with them and you try to learn what has worked in their institute and what can be implemented in ours so in though uh, it can be a give and take policy and you learn from one another in addition to that you also need to learn how to work alone also because the problem what i think uh, happens is that when you start working in a team a lot you have a lot of delegation of work and um, even if it is a big task you would only be asked to do a very small portion of it and from that when you are asked to do a, a big uh, work you don't know how to manage your time you don't know what to do so it's very important that you learn to also work individually so you need to know how to work in a team as well as to work as an individual the next is verbal communication i think that is very important especially in a research career having a, a good uh, language skill because english is an international language and you need to have a good uh, control over your vocabulary uh, about uh, in your grammatical uh, make sure making sure that the, you don't make any grammatical errors but more than the language i think it is uh, important uh, to develop certain communication skills like listening to what the other person is saying to making sure that you give your opinions but in a way that it is not uh, hurting or it is not uh, judgmental so these are things that you need to develop so uh, when i uh, started working in this project when we used to have uh, meetings so when i went to london uh, two years back uh, i was the only junior researcher in a room full of uh, people from london who are uh, like much 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 more experienced than me in the research field and we were having a discussion so i was very i had a lot of inhibition in me to speak up there i had some points in me but i was very uh, inhib- i had a lot of inhibition to speak up and raise my opinions but they gave me a lot of encouragement because they knew very well that i was new to this field i don't have much knowledge here but they were uh, ready to listen to what i had to say and that gave me a lot of encouragement and i learned a lot from that because they are in a very high position they don't need to actually listen to the junior members in the team but they value what you say as well so you need to keep that in mind uh, even for any profession that you choose because just uh, by you know if you have a higher degree or uh, more experience doesn't mean that the person who is junior to you whatever he or she says is not valid so you need to be open to opinions you need to uh, have a good communication skill as well the next is uh, keeping up to date with new publications in your field of research uh, so as i said before whatever research you do it's very important that you write this up and you publish it in well reputed journals in addition to that you also need to read what is being published in your field of interest because every day there are a lot of publications that come out uh, in research journals so you need to make sure that uh, you are up to date with these uh, publications to ensure that you are not repeating or you're not writing or copying the same uh, what do you say same project here because uh, in uh, in a research field what i have understood is that uh, the the novelty always matters because uh, the first person who does it gets a lot of credibility and uh, you might be able to publish whatever you do in a research journal but the access that uh, work gets it's always the first person gets a lot of access a lot of uh, reviewers and viewer viewers who read that and comment about it so uh, after you are doing something in your hospital uh, that has already been done in so many other places people might read your work and say okay this is nothing different so if even if you read many of the research publications you will see in their discussion part that to the best of our knowledge this is the first kind of publication in our area so there should be something unique that you do it could be that uh, in your setting this is the first time that you that is novel so suppose uh, when we published our stewardship work nobody in india had published that before that so it was a novel work even though the uh, stewardship program was well established in other countries so you need to make sure that you read and understand the other publications in addition to that when you are writing research works you will you know that you need to cite a few papers in your discussion section or your introduction section so uh, keeping a database of these research articles help you to do that as well so for this um, i 
like uh, the Twitter social media profile. Uh, so if you follow the right people there, uh, the right researchers uh, who are from your uh, area of interest, or um, there are a lot of organizations like uh, the, the European Congress of Infectious Diseases or the International Society of Infectious Diseases, so they uh, publish a lot of papers. Uh, they give you the links of new uh, publications. They uh, put up their call for abstracts or their call for research uh, funding opportunities. So I find Twitter a lot uh, useful in that aspect. So the next is writing skill. I think I've already spoken about that uh, in my previous slides. So if you are interested in a research career, another opportunity that you have is doing a PhD. So I started doing a part-time PhD along with the Aspires project. Uh, it has been almost uh, three years now. So if you are thinking about a PhD after a farm B, uh, you need to uh, keep a few things in mind. So definitely doing a PhD uh, will give a good blend of clinical knowledge and biomedical research skills. So again, as I said, for as a skill for research activities, you need to have a passion to learn more. I think for a PhD, this is more important because you are going to invest a long time in this work. So it can range for anywhere from three to six years to complete your PhD, depending on whether you are doing a part-time or a full-time PhD. And uh, you need to have that drive and that passion to learn to complete this duration. Because uh, at times what I see is that uh, with other researchers, and at times even I feel that because halfway through your research you feel that oh i have not reached anywhere there is there's a long way to go but you need to keep uh, keep up that interest in that uh, research project and read more about it create your own drive to take it forward and it definitely depends upon your individual interest so nobody uh, like what you do for your uh, undergraduate or postgraduate courses i don't think uh, you should take up a phd because someone else told you to do it because this is something that has to be driven by your own passion and you are the key drivers of it. You don't have a set curriculum to complete it. You don't have a set uh, rules to complete it. It is your work and you decide how it has to go. Some of the points that you need to uh, remember if you are applying for a PhD in any university is that you should have quality publications. So having uh, just too many number of publications in uh, various researchers. So what I see sometimes is that people uh, change the title a bit and publish it, publish the same matter as two different projects, two different publications. So you should avoid doing such things. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Johnson, who spoke in the last webinar uh, last Monday, uh, he already told about uh, about uh, how you need to you know publish your research works and what are the criteria that they look uh, into a candidate who's applying for a PhD in their institution. So I think those things uh, do apply for any institution uh, across the world, whether you're applying it in India or in any other countries. They, there are some basic uh, criteria that need, you need to follow. So one is that you need to have quality publications. <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, again, ensure that the topic that you have selected is novel, especially for a PhD, this is very, very important because you are doing something that is novel. So you need to make sure that this has not been done by anybody else in this uh, field. So that is very important. So you can do that by uh, searching for articles that has been come out uh, in the similar terms. There are some uh, theses or uh, databases that are available online. Go check in that, type your research uh, question or your uh, you know, tentative title and see if there are other published uh, theses works on this. So these are some preparatory steps that you need to do. The next is identifying a well accredited university, whether it is in India or it is abroad. You don't want to spend about uh, two, three years of your life and then halfway down the line, you get to know that the university has lost its accreditation. So make sure that you uh, do PhD in a well-recognized university. And uh, you also need to read and understand what the university uh, gives in their guidelines for applying for a PhD. Because each university will have a specific criteria 
uh, regarding uh, how you need to apply, what are the basic qualifications that you need to have, etc. So make sure that you uh, read and understand them and you comply to them uh, when you apply for the uh, PhD. The next, and I think it is a very key step, is identifying the guide and co-guide. So uh, when you identify your supervisors, make sure that they are people who have a sound knowledge and experience in your field of interest. So definitely they are not going to uh, tell you what to do and they're not going to you know, come behind you and say that like, you need to do this within this time. Nobody is going to do that because this is your work and you decide when to do it, what to do it. But you need to have uh, uh, supervisors who, to whom you can you know, approach them to uh, ask any questions that you have. And if you feel you're getting stuck, they can guide you to take matters forward. So what you need to understand here is that Nobody is going to come behind you and say what you need to do. You decide how you have to do it, how much time you want to take, etc. The, uh, the university would give a broad timeline, say like three to six years is the general duration of a PhD. But how you want to divide this three years or how you want to do the six years is how you, uh, you know, uh, decide. So again, selecting whether you want to do a part-time or a full-time PhD. So you can choose a part-time PhD if you want to uh, continue your uh, PhD along with uh, another uh, full-time job that you're doing. Or you can do a full-time PhD where you don't work, but you completely focus on a research study, uh, on a PhD work. That again depends upon your individual interest. The next is looking for funding opportunities. I think that is very important because uh, especially when you are uh, looking for a PhD, uh, abroad, you you need to have uh, funding for uh, covering your tuition fees, your expenditures there, because uh, it is generally expensive there, as many of you might know. And even if you are doing a PhD in India, it, the cost is not going to be very less as well, because uh, depending on the project that you choose, in addition to your tuition fee, you'll also have some individual uh, cost associated with the project. So if you're doing some lab-based project, you would need uh, some uh, funding for you know, the instruments or the reagents that you're using. So depending on the project that you choose, you would have some uh, you know, individual costing associated with it. It's always good to look for funding opportunities. There are a lot of funding agencies that, uh, that uh, call for uh, funding opportunities. And uh, when you uh, apply uh, to these uh, funding agencies, make sure that you read what they are calling for because the same funding agency can call for different areas of research. So sometimes they would call for antibiotic stewardship, sometimes they would call for something that is related to nephrology or neurology. So you don't want to uh, send your uh, proposal to the wrong funding agency and get rejected out front itself. So these are some points that you, you need to remember if you are planning to do a PhD after a family program. So the next is uh, what would be the, your opportunities once you complete a PhD after a PharmD? So definitely you can work in academic institutions. I believe uh, many academic institutions in Kerala itself, they demand a PhD uh, as a qualification if you need to work in a, in a uh, pharmacy college. So definitely you have opportunities there. The next is work in research projects. Uh, so I have a colleague uh, from South Africa who's, who has completed her PhD and is working as a pharmacist in our project. So you can work in these kind of uh, international projects even after you complete your, pharm uh, your PhD degree. The next is you can uh, initiate research activities on your own. You can go on to apply for postdoctoral fellowships and you can start uh, writing research proposals uh, to initiate research activities in your hospital. So these are some broad opportunities that you have after you complete your PhD. So just talking very briefly about the PhD that I do. Uh, so in my PhD, what I'm trying to uh, see is how can the role of clinical pharmacist in antimicrobial stewardship can be improved in Kerala by learning experiences from uh, South Africa and United Kingdom. So uh, South Africa is, a, is also a low middle income country like India, but there the uh, stewardship program was uh, initiated much before it came into place in India. While in UK, uh, it is a high income country where uh, the stewardship program was initiated many years back and the role of pharmacist in a stewardship program is also well established. 
So my experience of uh, doing a PhD in this area, uh, I had an op I had uh, many opportunities to discuss and to interact with healthcare workers in South Africa and in UK who are very much involved with antimicrobial stewardship activities in their respective countries. And uh, I could learn a lot from them because uh, in each setting, uh, although you say the broad aim of stewardship is this, in each country it differs. And the role of pharmacist also differs in each country. Some countries it is very well established, some places it is not so well established. And the challenges that they faced and how they have overcome those challenges were all learning lessons for me. And I uh, found it really interesting to talk to them, to interview them, to observe their activities in their hospital, etc. The uh, next is uh, to understand the perceptions of uh, clinical pharmacists in, in, in Kerala. So I also did a few interviews of uh, clinical pharmacists within Kerala to uh, understand what do they perceive of their uh, role in a stewardship program and what do they think are their challenges and uh, the skills that they gain and what is the message that they have for other uh, budding pharmacists. In addition to interviewing clinical pharmacists, I also interviewed uh, various doctors who are associated with the stewardship program in Kerala and to understand what is their understanding about uh, the clinical pharmacist role and uh, what do they expect from a clinical pharmacist uh, when they are employed to a stewardship program. The next is exploring potential collaboration. So like I said, uh, for a PhD, it is you who decide how you need to take things forward. So you need to explore, uh, I, I had to explore uh, what uh, collaborations that I could do, whom to collaborate with, uh, who, uh, so to look for people, to look for opportunities for collaborations, etc. The next is time management. And that is one uh, major thing that I learned uh, in, in this course of doing a PhD because uh, you, like I said, you are the one who decides how you need to take the things forward. Because you don't have anyone to, you know, uh, push matters or to come behind you to give deadlines, etc. You tend to take things lightly at times, and that really impacts your work. So for uh, me, what my supervisors have done, they have given me six months duration, and every six months I need to prepare a timeline. And uh, at the end of the six months, they evaluate whether I have completed the task that was uh, that I suggested that I would take, I would complete in the six months time. And if there are any outstanding activities, they ask me uh, why it is not completed and by when I think it can be completed. So that really instilled a sense of uh, time management in me and uh, uh, ma made me sure, I mean, it, uh, you know, give me an opportunity to think and understand how I need to take things forward because nobody was telling me what to do, uh, like when to complete this. So in my project, nobody tells me, okay, you need to complete these many interviews with the next two months. Nobody does that. I need to tell them that next two months, I will do these, these, these works. And at the end of that uh, duration, they will, uh, you know, check if I have completed that or not. That is the role that a supervisor does. That was a great learning for me uh, after doing, I mean, while doing a PhD uh, in the hospital. And the next is definitely publication and presentation skills uh, that I've already discussed about. So this is basically what I had to discuss. Uh, I just wanted to show you some light on um, some of these emerging uh, opportunities in a clinical setting in India. Uh, because uh, I've heard many people say that uh, if you have completed PharmD, there is no scope in, in India. But uh, what I would like to say is that it is still emerging in India that you need to understand. Definitely, you need to understand that. So you need to work a lot more uh, to establish your role, to establish your job profile if you are planning to stay in India. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vrinda. It was really nice of you to have shared your experience and then inspiring our budding pharmacists. Now it's question time. I don't see any questions in the chat box as of now. Now, just uh, out of curiosity, when the, like when you are or as part of antibiotic stewardship, when you see an irrational use of antibiotic, how do you communicate that to a physician without offending him? I think that this question uh, I do get a lot from uh, students and interns as well. How do you talk? How do you communicate your recommendation? Or how do you? talk to a doctor and tell that you know it was inappropriate 
and we also faced a lot of difficulties initially because uh, the, the doctors were also new to this concept and outright they would say that i'm not going to listen to you who are you to come and change my prescribing pattern my patients are safe etc so what i would say is that uh, it is always better to not implement or to not enforce that recommendation on the doctor you can you can go and suggest to them that uh, these are the recommendation go with some guidelines go with some uh, you know uh, uh research uh, publications which show that your uh, recommendation is true so go with some references uh, go and talk to them in a very uh, polite manner and uh, tell and uh, tell them that uh, this is what uh, the research publications say and uh, this is uh, the dosing as per international guidelines or if you have some uh, institutional guidelines that is very good or you have uh, your own anti biogram talk to them based on that so what happens is that when you go to a doctor with a, a foreign research publication they say that uh, that's a different population you can't apply that to an indian population that's extremely different so it is always good if you have some national guidelines or some uh, publication from india or if you have institutional guidelines you take that with you and you talk to them and i feel that uh, in in my experience that has made a difference because when you uh, show them that there is a reference to it and that you're not you know talking it out taking it out of the moon just giving them blank uh, recommendations and you give a proof for that recommendation i think that definitely changes and the way you communicate your your recommendation is also very important because you can't just go to them and say this is wrong you need to change that the way you communicate is very important uh, because you need to tell them that uh, based on this recommendation you are giving uh, uh, you are you are suggesting this dose or this antibiotic for this patient you need to give a justification for that and that enables them to convince and also when they see that uh, for one or two recommendations once they comply and they see a positive impact for their patient they uh, gradually start trusting you and uh, after maybe three or four instances you don't need to give a reference to what you are saying they blindly believe you and that is an added responsibility then because you can't tend to get wrong after that because they are going to blindly believe you and that is from my experience okay okay that was one and the other one was how about collaboration work so do you need to have a uh, institute like amrita for collaborating with these uh, international colleges so because many of our students would like to know whether they can have any collaborations with these colleges like the one you have the imperial college so can it be done by individual researchers or do they need the backup of a big institute um so you can write research grants uh, but it is always good to have a contact in another university to you know look for collaborations because you need to make sure that uh, the uh, collaborator is someone who whom you can work with so uh, say you are doing you are planning to initiate a research work and you have another pharmacist working in another institution whom you think uh, can have the same the, have the same passion and can be involved to the same extent that you are then you can collaborate on that aspect you don't need a big institution's name behind you to do that so just to give an example uh, for my phd work i am doing a systematic review as a part of my phd work and uh, i spoke to dr hisham who's who presented before me and i asked him whether he is interested to collaborate with me in this research work so he was willing for that and that is how uh, so i never took uh, the name of my institute for that i approached him directly and uh, because i knew him and i knew how passionate he is about uh, in research activities i felt i could approach him and you need to have that kind of contacts that is very important if you are planning for any collaborative work because you need to make sure that the other uh, person or the other institute is also going to be equally involved in the project okay thank you thank you and one interesting thing that i would like to uh, recollect and tell others see uh, i don't know dr vinda if you remember we had done a street play in your first in your uh, final year yeah, yeah yeah and in that we had a session or the street play was based on a channel tv channel right yeah. and it was a phone in program and guess who was the clinical pharmacist who was answering the questions it is the same person who you see on the screen right so a long way very yeah. good proud of you dr vrindar very thank proud you. of you so okay so thank you and i don't see any further questions so maybe uh, we will have to wind up the session so thank you uh, i'm sure uh, all of you will agree with me that the speakers have done a splendid job so on behalf of the college 
on behalf of all the participants. I thank both the speakers, Dr. Hisham and Dr. Vrinda, for their splendid job. You have really uh, helped us a lot. And I think the students who have heard will appreciate it and will have uh, got the keep home message, got their message. And then uh, I would also like to thank our uh, beloved director, Dr. Betty Kala Sister, and of course our principal, Dr. Sister Daisy PA, for their support and guidance. And then of course, uh, Sibi Sir, who's been running around show, organizing the things. So Sibi Sir, thank you very much. And then special thanks to our technology leads, that is Bobby Sir and Jiplomon Sir. Thank you very much for getting us all connected. And then of course, uh, thanks to all our teaching and non-teaching staff for their contributions. And then one very important people, you audience, you were very lovely. We really appreciate you for joining us. And we do hope that you have benefited from listening to the talks that have been there. And just to remind you that we still have talks in the pipeline. So please do join us. Then, Janima, thank you very much. You have, as usual, done a splendid job. And I, I think I've done a reasonably good job, right? So once again, thank you all. Do join us for the next part of the webinar series. It's bye for the time being. See you soon. This is Naveen Kumar Panikkar signing off from St. Joseph College of Pharmacy. God bless. Thank you all. Thank you.